Hi, everyone. I'm Georgina Sampat, Global Marketing Coordinator for Floralife, and welcome to our Fresh Cut Flowers webinar. Today, we're going to be focusing on spring flowers. Um, as most of you know, this is a monthly initiative. So every last Thursday of the month, we will um, host a webinar that focuses on flowers, flower varieties, um, and flower care and handling. Our goal is to bring you useful and educational information in 30 minutes. On your screen at the moment, you can see a table with dates and topics. These are the next Fresh Cut Flower webinars that we've planned. Um, take note of the ones that you like. Uh, make sure to put it down in your calendar, um, but you will definitely be receiving invitations for the next ones. Before I hand over to our host, Technical Support Representative Emma Bradford, I just want to let you know that if you have any questions, definitely use the chat function. Um, send us your messages during the webinar. Um, at the very end, Emma will do a question session and she'll try and answer any questions you guys have. Um, this is also being recorded, uh, so you'll get to see the webinar afterwards uh, through a link that I'll email you guys. Enjoy the webinar. Take it away, Emma. Thank you, Georgina. <laughs> so just to give you a little roadmap of what we're going to be going over today. Firstly, what do we classify as spring flowers? And how do they grow? How we should treat them with some specific considerations? And lastly, to finish, some fun facts to impress your friends with. So spring, what could be more uplifting after a long, dark winter than the sight of brightly colored spring flowers? These first signs of spring signal the end of the cold, short days and the beginning of the warmer weather. New life, new beginnings, baby lambs in fields, songbirds returning from migration and buds bursting into life. So with all of that, what is not to love about spring flowers? But what are they exactly? Well, fundamentally speaking, they're the first flowers to bloom after winter. So typically we think of bulbs and tuberous crops, such as tulips, narcissus, anemone, ranunculus, hyacinth, freesia, iris. Although in some locations, these two crops, freesia and iris, are grown year round, not just in spring. And then lastly, Convalaria, or also known as Lily of the Valley. And that crop is popular with spring brides, largely due to its delicate structure and its lovely fragrance. And so those are just to name a few of the most popular crops. But other spring cut flowers you might come across are Fritillaria, Alliums, and Muscari, also known as Grape Hyacinths. Then we have another category of spring flowers, which are your flowering branches. Now, these can add an instant spring feeling to any bouquet, even if you don't include any of the bulb crops that I just mentioned. And again, these are the trees or shrubs that we tend to notice in the spring, which bloom before the leaves emerge, making the blossoms all the more noticeable. Some of the most common ones of these are salix, also known as willow, Corylus, which is also known as hazelnut, prunus, or your cherry blossom, forsythia, or as some might say, forsythia. Now, my systematics professor assured me that when it comes to pronunciations, as long as you say it quickly and with confidence, no one will question you. And that goes for Latin names as well. And continuing with quince, acacia, which is also known as mimosa, and lastly, witch hazel. Again, these are the most common ones, but other ones you might see are lilac, apple, dogwood, and hawthorn. So how do they grow? Well, let's think about the environment in which they grow for a moment. So in spring, the weather tends to warm up a bit, especially during the day, but nights can still be chilly. And typically, there's still a risk of frost at night or even a chance of some late snowfall in some areas. So the flowers that do grow in the spring 
typically enjoy cooler temperatures. And I'd like you to keep that in mind for when I go over the care and handling. So what triggers sunflowers to bloom in the spring? Well, there are two factors, vernalization and photoperiod. Now, some of you will be saying to yourselves, vernalize what? It's vernalization. And it's just a sciencey way of saying that the plants require a period of cold temperatures to trigger the flowering. Now, how cold and for how long would depend on the flower species and the variety. Now, let me take a moment just to give you a refresher and clarify everybody on species and variety, what the difference is. So species, think of dogs. So with dogs, the species is a dog. Then the variety are all your different types of dog. So your species will be dog, and then your variety or breed could be poodle, chihuahua, beagle, labrador, whatever. So that's the difference between species, which is dog, and variety, which is the breed. And because of those differences, that's why you might find different colours of tulips flowering earlier or later in the season, because different varieties of tulip require different day lengths or different periods of vernalization in order to trigger to them to flower. Now, photo period is just a sciencey way of saying day length. So short days versus long days. Now, Plants technically measure the length of the nighttime, not the length of the daylight. But that's just a technicality. We still classify plants as being short day or long day plants, depending on the photo period that triggers them to flower. So to sum it up, basically what triggers plants, plants to flower in the spring is a combination of cold temperatures over the winter and then longer day lengths. I'm going to give you some generic care and handling, and a lot of these tips and uh, recommendations can be used for most all flowers, not just for spring flowers. So, uh, with most cut flowers, there are some basic steps you can follow to preserve as much vase life as possible. Now, why did I just use the term preserve? Well, when any cut flower is harvested, it will have a set number of days of life in it. Now, how many days it has in it will depend on the type of crop it is, so the species, so whether it's rose or chrysanthemum, for example, and then which variety it is. And lastly, um, what the growing conditions were or the pre-harvest conditions were of that flower. Once the stem is harvested, the vase life clock will start ticking. And so the goal is to preserve as many vase life days as possible. Each step after harvest that is done incorrectly, the clock will speed up and you'll lose vase life days. Now, you can't slow down the clock per se, but you can prevent it from speeding up. The main way you can prevent vase life, uh, preserve vase life is by storing the stems at one to three degrees and maintaining the cool chain from grower to consumer as much as possible. By keeping the stems cold, we can in effect slow down their metabolism so they just tick over and don't deplete their energy stores. Think of it like this. So storing stems in the cold versus storing them in ambient temperatures is like the difference between me walking versus sprinting a marathon. If I walk it, I will probably manage to complete the full 26 miles at some point. But if I sprint it, I'll not nearly make it that far. I doubt even Hussein Bolt could sprint a full marathon. We just, we just don't have the energy reserves for it. And it's the same for the flowers. So storing them in the cold helps to preserve the energy or the food that they have stored up inside them. But as soon as they are moved to an ambient temperature, their metabolism speeds up and they begin to use up their energy stores and developing an opening as if they would, as if they were still on the plant. And this is true for all flower types, 
not just spring flowers. Well, almost all. The only exceptions are tropical flowers, which prefer ambient temperatures to be stored at, and that's to prevent any chill damage. And so the, the temperature that you should store tropical flowers at is 13 to 15 degrees Celsius. Next, the relative humidity of wherever you're storing your flowers should be 75 to 85 percent. If the relative humidity is lower than 75 percent, you run the risk of your stems becoming dehydrated. But if it's higher than 85, then you run the risk of botrytis developing. Now, ideally, you should minimize the amount of time the flowers are outside of the cool chain as much as possible. Then, as far as post-harvest products go, there are, roughly speaking, three main types. And by post-harvest products, I mean bucket solutions or flower foods. And the three main types are, firstly, your hydration solutions. Now, these tend to be used directly after harvest, and as the name suggests, these are designed to keep the stems hydrated and full of water. They tend to contain little to no sugar, and the floral life hydration solutions you might be familiar with are Hydrofloor 100, Express Clear 100 Hydrofloor, uh, Hydrofloor Ultra 100, and in Colombia, we also have Bulb 100, so specifically for bulb crops. The second type are transit and storage solutions. These are the solutions you're most likely to use if you store flowers uh, at wholesaler, at florist shops, bouquet operations, or to display flowers in retail stores or supermarkets. And these solutions hydrate stems, but also contain food in the form of sugar. Not a huge amount, but just enough to help replenish the stems to keep their energy stores stocked up. The floral life transit and storage solutions you might know are easy dose sachets, clear 200, clear ultra 200, and then lastly, express clear ultra 200. And lastly, the third type of vase is the vase solution. And this is designed to hydrate and nourish the stems so they remain hydrated and have all the food or sugar they need to open and develop as if they were still attached to the plant. Vase solutions are supplied in sachet form for the convenience of the consumer. And there are two vase solutions Floral Life produce. One specifically designed to feed roses and a universal flower food, which can be used with any other flower crop. Now, both formulas are available in liquid or powder form. And in the express formulas, which can be used on stems without the need for recutting. Regardless of the type, the post-harvest solutions I mentioned are all designed to lower the pH of the water where they are mixed with. This is because the stems uptake solutions best when the pH is between 3 and 5. So now you know all the different types of solutions, how else can you help to preserve the life of your flowers once they are home? Well, firstly, always use a flower food sachet that is provided and add the correct amount of water to it. So if the sachet says to add one litre of water, add one litre of water. Now you, you can say, why does that matter? Well, as I mentioned before, the flower food contains food in the form of sugar and an acidifier to lower the pH. If the amount of water you add is too much or too little, the final pH of your flower food may be too high or too low. And also, the flower food solution just won't work as well as it could. It's a bit like making a cake. If you don't add the ingredients in the correct amount, you won't get the best cake. Now, once your solution is correctly made, ensure that all the leaves that will be below the waterline are removed. Now, this will do two things. It will prevent you from adding unnecessary bacteria to the vase solution and it will prevent those leaves from becoming a food source to any bacteria that are present when they begin to rot. Keep your flowers in as cool a location as possible, keeping them out of direct sunlight and drafts. 
This will help to prevent their metabolism from speeding up and will also reduce the risk of dehydration. Now, in general, it's a good idea to keep cut flowers and flowering plants away from fruits and vegetables. This is because some fruits and veg give off a gas called ethylene. Now, most people are familiar with the trick of placing a banana with other fruits to help the fruit ripen. Well, that's because green bananas produce ethylene, which is the ripening hormone. But bananas are not actually the biggest producers of ethylene. Fresh apples, passion fruit, avocados and tomatoes can actually produce more ethylene than bananas. And when ethylene comes into contact with some flowers and flowering plants, it can cause the flowers to wilt prematurely. And then lastly, be aware that some spring bulb flowers can shorten the vase life of other flowers if mixed together in the vase. Now I'm going to go over that a little bit more later on. Now, most of you will already be very familiar with the recommended opening stage at which you should buy your spring flowers. But for those who aren't, this is a good visual of the stages you should be buying at and at which you should be, they should be used in bouquets or arrangements to ensure that your customers enjoy the maximum vase life that they can. If you buy stems at a tighter cut stage than is shown, you run the risk that your flower will be too immature and may not fully open and develop during the vase life. If it is more advanced, the flowers could be damaged in transit and the vase life could be shorter. So some specific care and handling tips for spring flowers. There are specific, some specific spring flowers which benefit from crop specific handling techniques. And the first one of these are hyacinths. Now, when you buy hyacinth stems, they will be relatively short anyway, because that's just the way they grow. But they are sold with a structure called the base plate still attached to them. The base plate is where the roots warrants attached, and this structure aids in the water uptake. So it's recommended that you leave this intact if possible to achieve the best possible vase life. Next are your narcissus or daffodil. Now, these can be stored dry at um, one to three degrees, just dry in crates. Here in the UK, actually, where they're field grown and harvested from about December, January to April, May, depending on the weather, there are common sight in supermarkets where they are sold dry and in bud, just like the picture in the bottom left. Now, daffodils exude a mucusy clear slime when they are cut and this is toxic to other flowers and it's for that reason that it is not recommended that you combine them with any flowers in a bouquet or arrangement if you want to achieve maximum vase life. However, for an event such as a wedding uh, where your arrangements simply need to look good on the day, combining daffodils with other flowers will be absolutely fine. So. Tulips have a reputation for being bendy, and there are two reasons that this can happen. One is that the tulip stems to continue to grow after harvest. The other is due to dehydration during transport. Now, to overcome the first cause, so the elongation, tulips must be pre-treated with Tulip 100. That's the only way to prevent that stretch. But to overcome the second cause, which is simply wilting and dehydration, simply allow the stems to hydrate in water with their sleeve still on. So you would do this by cutting one to two centimeters or about an inch off the bottom of the stems while the sleeve is still in place. Then place your stems in a clean container with fresh water and leave them in cool location to hydrate for two to four hours with the sleeve still on. Then once they're hydrated, remove the sleeves and recut the stems to your desired length and then replace them back into clean, fresh water. Now, lastly, 
I've seen a few websites recommend that you pierce the stems of tulips just below the head with a pin. Please, please, please don't do this. The websites who had this claim that this is done to release air bubbles from the hollow stems and to aid water uptake. Okay, firstly, you will all know if you joined or watched the last webinar that tulip stems are not hollow to begin with. And even if they were, sticking a pin in them would not release any air bubbles. All this is doing is creating a wound in your tulip. And at best, it will do nothing. And at worst, it could actually reduce Var's life. So please, please don't stick pins in your tulips. So branch opening stages, these are interesting. So just as I covered opening stage of bulb flowers, flowering branches must also be purchased at the correct opening stage. Again, most of you will be already familiar with these opening stages. But for those of you who aren't, please use this slide and the next one as your reference guides. So on this slide, you will see the opening stages are set from one to five. So one being the tightest to five being fully open. And here you can see the five stages for acacia or mimosa and for sissia. And then on this slide, you can see the stages for cherry blossom or prunus and pussy willow or salix. Now, the main reason I wanted you to see these is so that those of you who have never used flowering branches before can get an idea of what they look like when they're sold and what to expect when they're open. So I have some specific care and handling recommendations for branches. So using the example below, which is the forsythia, you should purchase your stems in bud. So at opening stages one, two or three. Stages three to four being the opening stage at which you would place them in an arrangement. If you are using them for an event such as a wedding, then stages four to five would be ideal. On arrival, recut your stems and place them on a transit solution, such as Express Clear Ultra 200. Then store them at 8 to 10 degrees for four to six hours or overnight. And this is done to acclimatize them. So they would be coming out of cold and the 8 to 10 degrees is a medium point before they move to ambient. Then once you've left them to acclimatize 8 to 10 degrees for four to six hours or overnight, then you would move them 20 degrees C's and that is to encourage them to, to open. If time is of the essence, then placing the stems on a vase solution, such as Floral Life Universal Flower Food Sachet, will provide additional sugar to help encourage flower development and opening. But if they're opening too quickly, Leave them in the transit solution and then move them back to 8 to 10 degrees. If they have already opened to the desired opening stage, then move them back to 1 to 3 degrees and that would halt any more opening from, from occurring. Then lastly, I'm going to go over some fat facts for you. This is our favourite bit. So remember from Botany 101 webinar, how I showed you the flower structures and how they develop, including the male and female parts. Well, the photos on the top and middle left are actually flowers growing on the same plant. They are both hazelnut flowers. But the one on the top is all female flower and the picture in the middle is an all male flower. And if you look really carefully, you can actually see the small female flower at the very tip of the branch on which the male flower is growing. Then some of you might have heard of tulip mania. Tulip mania is a phenomenon which is an example of the first economic bubble. So originating from Central Asia, tulips became hugely popular in the Netherlands in the 17th century. And it culminated in a phenomenon called tulip mania. Now, during this time, tulips began selling for huge sums of money and were even used as a form of money themselves. 
And so they were actually um, swapped for properties. So properties were sold for just a handful of tulips, which is crazy. In 1633, for instance, a single bulb of Semper Augustus, which was an extremely rare and much coveted variety, was worth 5,500 guilder. But by January 1637, so just four years later, this worth had doubled to 10,000 guilder. So 10,000 guilder at that time was enough to feed, clothe and house a whole Dutch family for half a lifetime. Or enough to buy the poshest home on the most fashionable canal in Amsterdam. By the end of 1637, the tulip market had collapsed due to the prices being far too high and demand disappearing, causing a, a catastrophic fall in prices and the end of tulip mania. Then I have two more interesting facts for you uh, about physiology. So have you ever seen snowdrops or crocuses growing straight up through the snow? Have you ever wondered how they do that? Well, those plants actually produce their own heat so they can melt through the snow and emerge on the other side. Neat, huh? And then lastly, have you ever planted bulbs then decided to move them years later? Well, if you have, you'll have likely been surprised to find that they were a lot deeper than you remembered planting them in the first place. Well, that's because over time, bulbs actually bury themselves. They have what's called contractile roots, and if you look carefully at the picture bottom left, which is a close-up of a hyacinth bulb roots, you will see the roots have little horizontal lines on them. Well, what you are seeing are the ridges caused by the roots growing down on contracting on themselves. When the roots are growing in the soil, the roots contract and pull the bulbs deeper into the ground. And with that, I'd like to thank you for joining. Hopefully you learned something new or interesting, or at the very least, something to impress your friends with. Does anybody have any questions? Thank you, Emma. Yep, while you were presenting, we got a few questions from our attendees. Let me scroll through them and see. Uh, Emma, can you please remind us what the ideal storing temperatures are for flowers versus tropicals? Ah, yes. So tropical flowers, like I mentioned, um, you don't want to keep them in cold. So one to three degrees is out for those. For tropical flowers, you want to store them at uh, 12 to 15 degrees, so more ambient. And then all your other crops should be at one to three degrees. Okay. Would flowers last longer if kept in freezing environments? Good question. Um, no. So just like water freezes and forms crystals, when the flowers get to a certain temperature, so at freezing, the water inside the flowers will actually freeze, form crystals, and it can actually burst the, the cells, which is what causes frost damage on some plants outside. So. I definitely wouldn't recommend going below one degree on most flowers because you'll okay. just cause chill damage, basically. Okay. Um, is it okay to have flowers on the sales floor during the day and then back in the cooler at night? That's a tricky one. I don't recommend it um, just because from a technical point of view, it really isn't the best thing to do. But we live in the real world, so there are some shops that might have to do that. Um, if you absolutely have to do that, I would recommend limiting it. But key, keep in mind, when you move flowers from cold to warm, you're stressing them. And you will cause condensation on them, and you will just reduce vase life, basically. So it is best to keep them in the cold chain as much as possible. Yeah. Understood. Do we have any Floralife solution to reduce the toxicity in daffodils? Sadly, no. Um, the best thing I can recommend to reduce the toxicity is to place the daffodils in, in water for 24 hours to help dissipate that 
that mucus before placing them with other flowers. Um, but yeah, unfortunately, we don't have anything like that. Are any bulbs reused after their tulips are cut? Ah, um, it depends. So in the cut flower industry, so for growers who are just growing tulips for cut flowers, the bulbs are actually just used once. And so what the cut flower growers will do is they buy all their bulbs in fresh every year and then they are grown hydroponically. So they, the bulbs are placed in plastic trays, no soil. They're put into a, a cold store to get that vernalization process uh, done. And then they are moved out into warm greenhouses and just kept hydrated. So it's completely hydroponic. And then the flowers grow out, of, well, the bulbs grow out of soil in the greenhouses. And then when the flowers are harvested, the bulbs are removed from the flowers and they are discarded, basically. But tulip bulbs typically are perennial. So if you plant a bulb out in your garden, it will typically flower year after year, but it will only give you one flower per year. Okay. Um, if we need to cut tulip stems, Express is not adequate? Um, it will hydrate, definitely, but it won't prevent the stretch. In order to prevent that stretch, and if you remember from Botany 101, the reason that tulips stretch is because they have that growth zone all along the stem. So even after they've harvested, they will still continue growing. The only thing that will prevent that stretch is the tulip 100. And those need to be treated after harvest with that. Uh, otherwise, they're going to continue growing. Um, and then our last question, is there any pre-treatment to export blossoms in dry conditions, boxes, and preventing a worse vase life? Hmm. I would have to know which branches they are. So in any case, I definitely recommend using a hydration solution after harvest, but before they get shipped. So any of the hydrofloor solutions uh, would work for that. And then a hydration at minimum of six hours to 24 hours before they get shipped. Um, but if that questioner wants to email or send in the message and let us know what crop it is, so which species they're actually working with, we can maybe give them some better recommendations and yep. something general. Good one. Info at florlife.com. Um, if you, if this attendee wants more info, we'd gladly help them further. Um, Emma, that was it. Those were all our questions. Um, thank you, Emma, for uh, the great presentation. Thank you to everyone who attended. Um, We'll make sure you receive the link to the recorded webinar next week. So definitely keep an eye on your mailbox and have a great day. Bye.